an elf told me that uh, time travel is possible, but it's, it is constrained in ways which are not normally part of our expectation of time travel. The way in which it's constrained is once time travel is discovered, you can travel as far into the future as you wish, but you can't travel into the past any further than the uh, moment of the invention of the first time machine. The reason for this is that before the invention of the first time machine, there were no time machines, and how can you take a time machine into a domain where there aren't any? <laughs> you see, it's just to, to preserve logical consistency. That's like saying you can't drive a car where there hasn't been a car driven before. That's right, you can't take a car where there are no roads. When, when cars were first invented, the main objection to them was, what are you going to do with this thing? <laughs> You know, there's nowhere to, you know, it can't go where a horse can go, so what good is it? Um, so here's a fantasy scenario, uh, which for a while I liked very much. It's that quantum physics and uh, nanotechnology and all this malarkey is uh, refined and focused toward the notion of building a time machine so that then uh, on the morning of December 22nd, 2012 at the World Time Institute in the Amazon, the first time journey is about to be taken and the whole world is watching on holographic television as the lady temponaut is strapped into the machinery that will hurl her centuries into the future. And there's a countdown and a button is pushed and off she goes. Now most people's interest would be to follow this woman wherever she's going, but let's forget her for a moment. The point has been made, she disappears, we assume she went off into the future. But what happens right there, right then? It seems to me in the very next millisecond, thousands of time machines would begin arriving from the future simply because they had driven to the end of the road. They had come back in time to witness the first journey into the future. It's as though you could take your Piper Cub and fly it to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1906 to see the right flyer take off. You see? Are you all with me so far? Yeah. Oh yeah, right. <clears throat> now, there's a problem with this, which some of you I'm sure are thinking, I hope anyway, uh, which is what's called the grandfather paradox, which is the old conundrum that haunts all time travel schemes, which is, if time travel were possible, you could go back in time and kill your own grandfather. Well, then you wouldn't exist. Well, so then this sets up a uh, logical impossibility. Either you exist or you don't exist. And some science fiction authors have, have assumed that, that somehow massive influxes of synchronicity would preserve your grandfather. You know, you would approach him with your Saturday night special, but it would blow up in your hand, or it would ricochet off the St. Christopher medal he always wore, or something like that, because he cannot be killed by you, because in that case you wouldn't exist, in which case he couldn't be killed by you. And this troubled me for a long time then. What exactly would happen? in this situation if a time because the the according to Hans Moravik of the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon University I mean time travel is no big deal the first paragraph uh, um, of this paper the last few years have been good for time machines 
Kip Thorne's renowned general relativity group at Caltech invented a new quantum gravitational approach to building a time gate, and an international collaboration gave a convincing rebuttal of the grandfather paradox arguments. Another respected group suggested time machines that exploit quantum mechanical time uncertainty. The technical requirements for these suggestions exceed our present capabilities, but each new approach seems less onerous than the last. There is hope yet that time travel will eventually become possible, even cheap. So I then saw another possibility, and this is the way we can fulfill the expectation of Christian hermeneutics, and, but not require the second coming of Christ or the intercession of God Almighty into history or all these other extreme unlikelihoods. And to understand it, we have to have recourse to... Uh, um, physical model in a very simple realm of chemistry and physics, which is the Bernoulli gas laws. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these, and they're very intuitive and easy to understand. Uh, we, have a, we have a cylinder, and it's a vac it contains a vacuum. And at one end of the cylinder, we have a valve, and the valve is connected to a line which is connected to a tank of some inert gas, say nitrogen. So we open the valve to let the nitrogen rush into the cylinder uh, that previously was a vacuum. Now, what happens inside that cylinder, I think, is intuitively obvious to all of us. The pressure equalizes over all points equally. In other words, you can't have 50 pounds of pressure at one end of the cylinder and 5 pounds of pressure at the other. We understand that in a gas, pressure distributes itself evenly in order to achieve equilibrium. Okay, hold that notion in your mind. Now think of our world in the late 1990s uh, as a, 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 a sphere or a, or a cylinder of that sort and think of cultures as gases at various pressures and let's assign low pressures to the bare-assed folks in the Amazon and eastern Indonesia and let's assign high pressures to the folks in Manhattan and at Caltech and Cambridge and Los Angeles and London. Well, then we can predict correctly, in fact, what is happening sociologically on this planet. What is happening is that the high-tech cultures are totally overwhelming the traditional cultures. The values of Manhattan and Los Angeles are flooding everywhere, and in spite of the tiny lip service we give to shamanism and body painting, the truth of the matter is Amazon cultures are not really uh, making a major contribution at this point to the evolution of high-tech, global, information-dense, electronic culture. Okay, that's the second level of this Bernoulli metaphor. So now let's go back to the situation where we send the Lady Temple Knot off into the future. I'm not familiar with how they overcame the grandfather paradox, so we'll pretend that the grandfather paradox is very strong. I want to say something about the grandfather paradox. Okay, you'll, let me, I'm close to question time. Let me press forward relentlessly here <laughs> because the coffee's running out. I can feel it. The equilibrium density is dropping. Okay, so we send the Lady Temponaut off into the future, but now with what we know about the equalization of high cultures versus low in a temporal medium, what happens from our point of view is that the rest of the history of the universe happens instantly. 
that even if it's billions of years of, uh, of human culture and downloading into machines and claiming star system after star system and so forth and so on, somehow that the state vector of all of those event systems collapses. I call this the God Whistle principle. It's that we can actually call God into history. We can summon the end state of human evolution to appear a millisecond after we successfully achieve the implementation of this technology of time travel in order to avoid all the paradoxes that would prevail if there was any extension to the post-time travel era beyond the moment of its inception. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a way of, in a sense, forcing the evolution of the universe and it creates the phase transition of the eschaton and uh, is, to my mind, uh, a practical... Um, it, it creates the basin of attraction within the domain of our own lives. Now, is there any kind of precedent for something like this, even metaphorically in our own experience? Well, it turns out, yes, there is in a kind of bizarre anecdote which should sober us considerably as we think about these things. When the first atomic weapon was built by the Manhattan Project in the desert of New Mexico. Fermi and Oppenheimer and all these people got together the night before the test at Trinity. And Fermi had a, a, a pad like this on which he had scrawled some equations and he had reached the conclusion in the week before that they were not sure how high the temperature would go when they triggered this device and Fermi had some back-of-the-envelope calculations which caused him to believe that the nitrogen in the atmosphere of the planet would begin to burn if they tested this thing and that they would in effect ignite the atmosphere of the planet and the whole and the fireball would spread around the entire planet and destroy everything and they spent half the night going over these things and they finally decided that the information necessary to make the decision was not available and so they said well hell <laughs> throw the switch you know at least it'll get to show those Japs and Germans that we mean business <laughs> so <laughs> and then of course it, it, the test was carried out the, the nitrogen did not burn and instead we were ushered into the glorious era of um, weapons of mass destruction um, so let me see, I've got some notes here. I think I covered everything. Um, what's interesting about this is that for the first time in this article by Frank Tipler called The Omega Point as Eschaton, he, he seems, and this is why uh, Paul is here, and I couldn't really get into it because it's crazy to repeat what you can't understand, but by, uh, by an analysis and interpretation of quantum mechanics, Tipler reaches the conclusion that there is an omega point and that it does represent the funneling together of all the what are called world lines and he for purposes of mental uh, comfort sets it far in the future but in principle there is no reason to do that uh, 12 or 13 years ago, the Swedish cosmologist Hans Alfven wrote a wonderful little book called Worlds and Anti-Worlds in which he uh, made the suggestion that, um, that the uh, entire universe is what's called a, a, a vacuum fluctuation. Ex nihilo, literally out of nothingness 
however there's there's a caveat which is this creation ex nihilo can only occur if what's called parity is conserved now what this means is that um, these uh, particles which come into being out of nothingness must come into existence paired with their anti-particle and so it comes into being let's say the uh, an electron and an anti-electron and they divide on separate trajectories and then they reconnect and collide with each other and parity is conserved in other words nothing really happened no laws of physics were violated because they annihilated each other now for a long time um, a while this was thought to be entirely a kind of a theoretical construct and but then it was noticed that um, the theoretical models of black holes, which we referred to a few days ago, seem to imply that no radiation could leave a black hole, and yet certain kinds of black holes were observed to be giving off hard radiation in the form of X-rays. And it was realized uh, that what was happening was virtual uh, vacuum fluctuations were taking place in the vicinity of the black hole and because one particle went one way and one the other the black hole interfered with the conservation of parity and one of the particles was being sucked into the black hole and the other particle was flying off into the ordinary universe and being seen by astronomers as hard radiation so the the fact that this process goes on has now been confirmed well now an interesting thing about these vacuum fluctuations is that quantum physics places no upper limit on the size of a vacuum fluctuation what it says is that the smaller the vacuum fluctuation the fewer particles that are involved the more likely the vacuum fluctuation is and obviously from observing black holes we can see that very small vacuum fluctuations occur quite frequently well Alf then took all this and said well then is it not possible that the entire universe our entire universe is simply a very large vacuum fluctuation a vacuum fluctuation in, involving something like 10 high 50 particles and they have poured into uh, the manifold in which we find ourselves and an, an antimatter universe invisible to us because it's in another dimension was born at the same time and so one universe went off into a higher dimensional manifold this way and another one went off in the other direction and what this sets us up for is the possibility allowed by this interpretation of quantum physics that the entire universe could disappear instantly not gradually you wouldn't see the stars going out but the because this is all happening in a hyperspace of some sort which treats this manifold as a point like entity so what you would have is just click and all particles in the universe would disappear and the original unflawed nothingness would be restored actually no there's a further caveat to all this which is all particles have their anti-matter anti-particle twin except except the photon the photon is this mysterious particle which is different from all other particles it either has no anti-particle or somehow it has its own anti-particle embedded within it so what would happen in the case of a, of a universe which was a vacuum fluctuation which encountered its ghost image and conserved parity and cancelled all particles except photons is that you would suddenly have a universe made of nothing but light nothing but light 
And we then have to model the physics of a universe where the only kinds of particles that exist are light. Well, it's interesting that all these human traditions of transcendentalism make a big deal about light. I mean, light is the metaphor for spirit. And the supposition is that the rarefaction of matter and of the flesh releases us into a realm of light. And I am not physicist enough by a long shot to say what the behavior of a universe made of light would be, but I do know enough to say that if you or I were made of light, uh, our subjective experience of the universe would be ruled by relativistic physics and we would have the impression that we could go anywhere instantly and we would have the impression that the universe was aging around us at a tremendous rate because you see the time dilation of the general theory of relativity uh, says that as you approach the speed of light time slows down. Now, it's assumed that you can't reach the speed of light because as you approach the speed of light, your mass asymptotically increases so that to push a single atom to the speed of light would require more energy than there is in the entire universe because this particle would have become so massive that there isn't enough energy to propel it. But a photon never moves slower than the speed of light. It never moves faster than the speed of light either. So the photon, if you were made of photons and you went from here to Zenebel Ganubi, let's say, a star in our galaxy with a wonderful name, uh, your impression of the travel time would be zero. You wouldn't, and, and so, Again, here is a way without invoking God Almighty where physics seems to lay into our hands uh, metaphors for the anticipation of, uh, of the eschaton. Paul, do you want to say something at this point? It's fascinating to hear you're playing with physics. Um, you know, everything has to be conserved. No, it's not just parity in the, in the vacuum fluctuation. I mean, child, matter, antimatter charge the whole power is just one of the conservation one of a dozen conservation laws that has to be conserved in those uh, phenomena and um, they're happening all the time from the point of view of physics inside our body there's trillions of, of these virtual um, reactions occurring all the time and they can be intercepted I mean you, you can you can have a a, a, a gamma ray break into a particle and antiparticle and you can intercept them before they come back together again. And, and, and that's, that's, how the, that's how they're detected on photographic plates of cloud changes. But everything you say is, is right. One thing, I don't think this, this notion of the Big Bang, I mean, I'm not sure whether I subscribe to the Big Bang model, but it's, it's not so far-fetched, because if, uh, if there was something in the universe, then we'd have a real problem explaining how it got here. So the simplest thing to assume is that there's nothing here. You mean that we are in a vacuum fluctuation? Well, no, just that there's nothing here. I mean, that that, that there was nothing before the Big Bang and there's nothing after. There's this, just, this sounds that's like right. Buddhism. That's right, a vacuum fluctuation includes everything, good and evil, male, female, the whole thing added together as a zero, just like it always was. Well, then what is the... What are the complex appearances that impinge upon our senses, and what are we then? Because we we choose to pay attention to to only half of the situation. But if we could, if we will let ourselves be and experience the whole, then then it all it's all unified. It cancels. It all cancels to zero. Well, this refers back to something you and I were talking about at at uh, dinner. We all assume that there is one past and one future. But it's not clear why we assume that. I mean, think about it for a moment. We're all here gathered in this room sharing this moment, but we all have different pasts. Not one of us has the past of another. 
And so what we have in this room is a convergence of pasts. And when this meeting is over, we will go our separate ways into a variety of futures. So the assumption that there is one past and one future is just some kind of convenient mental bookkeeping. Uh, we could, and we are tremendously under the spell of this illusion. I mean, we worry about the future all the time. Well, notice that you could just move to an island somewhere and get a brown-skinned girl and then you wouldn't have to worry about anybody else's future because you would have made your own future. We can step out of the assumption of a universal history in which we're trapped. And I think realizing this is the beginning of a kind of liberation. Our assumptions... Uh, are the edges of our worlds. And this is one of our strongest assumptions, the assumptions that there is a past and a future, and our destinies are all caught up in that. But actually, you can, a word that rarely passes my lips, you can deconstruct that assumption and uh, and then you're given back a, a, a whole different way of looking at the experience of being, which is empowering. Because somehow, when we are embedded in the future, we feel we have no control whatsoever. We're like corks in a raging river. But in fact, that's a false model, I think. Anybody want to get in on this? And Yeah. Sometimes when I'm listening to you, um, I I have sort of the, the troubling thought that I think Terence hasn't done enough psychedelics, or I think um, <laughs> that you're too straight in some way. And, I, and it's when you get onto some of your scientific tracks, and as you put it, you're a rationalist. I start thinking, um, why well, get lost? And I start thinking. Um, I start referring to experiences I have have had of being altered, where a lot of this seems um, incidental to the experience, say, of one experience of eternity, or which I know you've had. And how do you reckon with yourself sometimes? And think when you say doubt yourself and think this is just my ego um, concocting things to make me feel good and et cetera, et cetera, whatever would be the worst case scenario for you. I, the, um, it's, it's hard for me to express this sort of well, but there, there's something about when you, you're, the way that you often refer to a science, sort of what seems to be a scientific model that um, is very linear, even as you talk, you know, well, I would certainly agree that I haven't taken enough psychedelics. Um, reading these people, it seems like... Uh, I mean, I, I doubt these guys are real psychedelic heads, and, and uh, they're much further out than I am. Um, the, real, the real truth is and I've said it many times, that the world is not only stranger than we suppose, it's stranger than we can suppose. And in a way, that's either permission to suppose anything you want, or to just stop supposing, you know? Um, these things are models. The real... Nowhere is it writ large that bipedal apes should be able to understand how the universe works. Still less likely is it written anywhere that Terence McKenna should be able to understand how the universe works. Were you here the other night when we talked about uh, the black hole theory of enlightenment? Uh, it was two nights ago. I was here, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the idea that the, that the real truth can't be told. I'm very aware uh, that all of this is just stuff to support me. 
to make a living, in other words, you know, um, that in fact what's really going on defies rational apprehension. I hope. I mean, I would hate to think, I would hate to think that we could understand what's going on. Nevertheless, there's something to be said for this modeling process. Uh, and I agree, I think I'm getting old. Uh, you can only push yourself so far. I mean, when I read uh, one of these things today, and he was off on some tear, and I just realized, you know, it struck fear in my heart. And I said, my God. You know, and I actually did a mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the weirdest one of all? And it said, Hans Moravik is the weirdest one of all. I said, shit, you know, what, what am I, you know, I, I should bring him here and sit at his feet. I don't know, am I talking about what you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> fantastic parallel between the psychedelic experience and, and physics. I mean, I haven't found anything in, in the psychedelic experience that would be any problem to to relate to from the point of view of the physicist. And actually, I think that all this stuff in physics got out of the bag because of the psychedelic, you know, breakthroughs in the 60s. I mean, Fritjof Kapper and others had psychedelic experiences and, and then started to ferret it out from... I mean, in the 1920s, people were puzzling about these things and, and having the spiritual crises and, 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 and throwing away all of their assumptions about reality and having these types of breakthroughs, and then it got lost because we started to, to bag physics to use for the military. And it was only with an environment that opened up because of the psychedelics that it, that it had come out. But I don't think that science, that the purpose of science is to understand reality. This may go to what you're saying. I think the purpose of science is to uh, advance technology, which is a heresy. I don't think reality can be understood and that it's absolute hubris for science to, you know, cloak itself in the mantle of philosophy. All it's for is to make better toys, or if you're nuts, better weapons. And um, ultimately, there's not going to be any closure in, in the effort to understand. And I think that the, the real the thing that you take away from psychedelics, finally, is that all models are provisional that there is no truth. We talked at one point in here about Wittgenstein's phrase, true enough, true enough, true enough to get you to the gas station, true enough to get your taxes paid, but uh, there'll, there'll, be no, uh, there'll be no closure on this stuff. We have to live in the light of the mystery but I think we also said in here, you know, it's the death of conversation if we glorify the mystery too much, because then, you know, I'll be just like everybody else here, and I'll announce that we're now going to have a meditation, which I've never done to you, I want to point out. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wanted to say... Well, with that in mind, I wonder how you can uh, project a, a, an end to eternity at a certain time. Well, I didn't mean to imply a nothingness beyond. It isn't like that. I think it's a it's an everythingness that when I talk about what I envision it as as boundary dissolution. If all boundaries dissolve, then you know I am you and you are me and we are all together. <laughs> it's a it's a exfoliation of the of the human experience i mean the great boundaries are you know the small boundaries are uh, man woman self world and then the big boundaries are life death uh, past future all of these will be dissolved into something like william blake's divine imagination and we will become uh, 
you know, our, our grandest dreams. And so the whole challenge is to dream a dream worthy of that dimension. I mean, it's a very interesting exercise. I don't know if you've ever done it. God, it comes close to being a visualization, I'm sorry to notice. But, <laughs> but have you ever played the game, uh, what would I do if I could do anything? First of all, you have to wrap your mind around the concept, anything. What would I do if I could do anything? And I used to think about it in terms, for some reason, for me, it takes the form of an architectural fantasy. You know, first of all, I just locate myself in the house featured in last month's Architectural Digest. Then from there, I would begin to work it out. Well, if you could do anything within a few minutes of entering into that exercise, you're unrecognizable to yourself. I mean, you don't even have to exist in a forward-flowing casuistry of three dimensions. Uh, you can be a number of species and all possible sexes. You can be translocated at many points in time. Uh, you, it, it, you begin to realize that you are tremendously limited by your assumptions and that if, and this is sort of what I imagine death is. It's release into the divine imagination. And if you're, you know, blown up in an airliner or something, then immediately after dying, you're just a dead person. But then you begin to unfold and test the boundaries. And, you know, as, as James Joyce says in Finnegan's Wake, uh, up in the end, prospector, you sprout all your worth and woof your wings. And that's just in the first 30 seconds that you woof your wings. Mm -hmm. And then you are able to assume, you to divide your consciousness, to assume any form, to be any place, to know anything. All, anything recognizable as human, I think, would quickly drop away or would just become a tiny and familiar touchstone that you would occasionally return to, to touch. And somehow the dying, which occurs to each one of us, that's the microcosm of the planetary and historical process that we're caught up in. It's the thing that we hate most of all. We fear it. We really get agitated when death is raised as an issue. James Joyce called it uh, the Grim Reaper, a blessing in disguise. If you want to be phoenixed, come and be parked. Meaning, you know, you have to die to fully exfoliate into this dimension. And sometimes I think, and I don't often say it to groups because I fear I'm misunderstood and I don't want people to go out of here depressed, but sometimes I think that what human history pushes for is the extermination of all life on the planet for the simple reason that we'll never be free till then. That we are in some kind of hell world and we are locked in a world of matter and energy and space and time and that it is not, you know, my God, this sounds like, uh, you know, uh, Southern Baptists, but <laughs> we are living death at this moment and that we must die in order to be born again. In other words, that somehow what we are has become trapped in a lower dimensional matrix and our greatest delusion is to cling to this most tenaciously. Jorge Luis Borges in one of his stories has this idea that uh, the species, uh, any species, is somehow not completed in eternity until the last member of that species dies. And it is interesting that if you think about biology, 95% of all species that have ever lived on this planet are extinct. This is what happens to species, is they go extinct. 
And yet, you know, we're driven to pursue immortality. It pains us greatly to imagine the death of all life on this planet and particularly the death of our individual selves or our species. But the fact of the matter is we don't know what death is. When, I mean, one of the puzzling things about the DMT trance is, you know, these creatures made of light in the mind that are so different from us but have such affection and love for us, they seem like relatives. They seem like, dare we whisper the word, they seem like ancestors. And yet, you know, we would rather believe that they were aliens from Zeta Reticuli or elves in a parallel continuum than apply Occam's razor to the phenomenon and say, since we are the only intelligent entities that we have ever contacted in this universe, these things which we contact in our minds in the center of the DMT flash, they must be human beings of some sort. But they don't look like human beings. But they love us so much and understand us so well. Well, is it possible that the kind of human being they are is a dead human being? That, that, that we're actually breaking through into an ecology of souls. I mean, if we say that the psychedelic experience is an experience of boundary dissolution, and if we say that DMT is the strongest of all psychedelics, then may it not be that it is dissolving the most resistant of all barriers, which is the barrier between the living and the dead, and that what you actually come into is the antechambers of eternity for a brief glimpse. If you were to take that rap and properly translate it into Witoto or Muinani or something like that and go to the Amazon and query those folks, they'd say, well, of course. I mean, your own Merciliad tells you that shamanism depends on the spirit ancestors. And for all the credit we give shamanism, we've never actually come to grips with the possibility that uh, shamans really do work with the spirit ancestors, that there really is an ecology of trans transmaterial human beings in a nearby continuum that can be approached by a boundary dissolving drug and it's because you know we and certainly I and certainly proven by this rap tonight are obsessed with technological explanations of it and how it's going to be the flying saucers, it's going to be the time machine or the collapse of the quantum vector or something like that. But because the forward thrust of our technology is toward immortality. I mean, that's what's gnawing at the back of our minds. And yet what may actually be coming toward us orthogonal, meaning at right angles to the historical process, is the dissolving of the barrier between the living and the dead, which is so unsettling and mind-boggling to us that we'd take a flying saucer invasion any day <laughs> over, over having that happen to us. And, and yet it's very, very late in the game. You know, human nature is going to have to undergo a radical vertical translation of some sort if we are to avoid um, the extinction of ourselves and all life on the planet. Well, so then, you know, uh, maybe that's what it was for. If we believe that we were always embedded in the machinery of nature, that we could never act outside the purposes of nature, then this must be what it's for. It's very interesting in embryology. I think most people think, you know, of a fetus in the womb. Uh, as you all know, we begin as very fish-like creatures in the womb. And then out of what are essentially little paddle mitts, 
the human hand appears. And I think most people think that the, the tissue retracts tightly and, uh, and that the human being emerges. But if you've seen fetal stages in bottles in medical schools, what's actually going on is that cells die off. A massive amount of dying goes on in the womb in order that the human form may emerge out of the fetal form. The webbing between the fingers doesn't retract. Those cells die and are released into the amniotic fluid. The, the growth of the fetus involves the death of millions and millions and millions of cells. So we are born. We are, you could almost say, sculpted into life by the hand of death. I, I don't, I mean, I feel as nervous about all this as you must, uh, but, you know, this is what we're here for, right? To stretch the envelope, yeah. Um, Terrence, I would like to go back to something that you said about uh, the beings of light and the shamanic capacity to see and to interact with these beings, and they could be the ancestors. Um, thinking in terms of those individuals who refined their senses to being able to see more than the average ability to see and to be able to hear more than just the normal ability to hear, where there's a growing awareness of almost like interpenetrating planes of beings that are actually coexisting with us, but we just can't hear them or see, see them because we haven't refined those senses enough. And, and the more psychically sensitive individuals have an increasing ability in a non-drug state to be aware. It's just they can see more and hear more. And I, I haven't heard you say that. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a very good point. The perfect example of it in terms of a cultural tradition is uh, uh, fairyland. Uh, fairyland is um, the pre-Christian Celtic peoples believed that dead souls stayed around in the immediate vicinity and that they, there were thousands of them all around, the accumulated dead, uh, very much in the way that when you smoke DMT, then there are thousands of these things. And it raises the question, were they always there or, or what's going on? St. Patrick, who uh, brought Christianity to Ireland, found this belief, and also Anita makes the point about sensitivity. In Irish folklore, there's the idea that if you have the eye, you can see these things, uh, and no drugs are required. It's a psychic ability, uh, which the country Celtic people have sometimes uh, claimed. So when Patrick came to Ireland on his mission of conversion, he found this belief in fairyland so powerfully entrenched in these people that he invented purgatory. Purgatory was invented by St. Patrick to convert the Irish. And then when word was carried back to Rome that Patrick, who was this great bishop of the early church, that he had made this doctrinal concession to Celtic folk thinking, the Pope thought it was such a fine idea that they just wrote it into dogma. So uh, purgatory, which as you all know is neither heaven nor hell, but a place where you expiate your sins for some amount of time before you pass on to heaven, is nothing less than a cleaned up version of fairyland written in to Christian theology. Now, I don't know why the Celtic people would have a not a monopoly, but a firm grip on this. I mean, it may be their innate gloominess, their obsession with death, their, uh, uh, it's called the agenbite of inwit. It's that we just chew on ourselves till we dissolve, but there was something about that character that set it up for perceiving uh, these entities, although in all traditions all over the world, 
uh, if you dig deep enough, you can usually find a tradition of small people that live in the hills or under the hills, meaning graves, right, under the hills, and they are the ancestors and the the best that straight folklorists can tell is they have some weird law that as the people recedes into time they shrink which seems to me preposterous I mean I just don't understand that I think that the evidence is pretty good that this is going on the fact that DMT is um, a naturally occurring neurotransmitter is very suggestive. Rupert Sheldrake has made the suggestion that dying is a unique chemical experience and he calls DMT a necrotic hallucinogen that that you actually the if you are truly dying your brain will be flooded with DMT and then you will see the ecology of souls waiting to receive you. I once questioned a very well-known Tibetan teacher uh, about what was going on in DMT and he said, yes, these are the lesser lights. He said, you can't, if you go further than that, you will break the thread of connection and be unable to return. And so, you know, I think this is the most challenging idea to us on the conscious and unconscious level because we may, you know, I mean, I'm only speaking for myself, but it seems to me true that we really have, at a profound level, accepted the scientific lie that death is non-entity, you know? And it, it's, it gives us, it's a permanently weakening idea because it makes us each such a finite being I mean it means that no matter what you do eventually you know it will all end in the cold cold ground you know always at my back I hear time's winged chariot hurrying near this coyness lady would be no crime had we but world enough and time the grave's a lovely private place, but none do there, I think, embrace. Well, maybe Andrew Marvel was wrong. Maybe there's more fun on the uh, other side than uh, you might wish to be congealed. Anybody, save me from myself. <laughs> Of what comes to mind is a is a world that you project where everybody is schizophrenic, so that uh, today I can be Napoleon, tomorrow Jesus, and I can meet somebody else who also believes that he is Napoleon, Jesus, Buddha, or whatever, and back and forth in time. Uh, I'm just wondering what what kind of a, a, a place that's going to be. Well, I would buy into that. I mean, I think, I think schizophrenia is the absence of cultural expectation. You know, in the most profound sense. I mean, the casuistry doesn't even apply. I mean, I, I speak, I consider myself schizophrenic. And I have observed schizophrenia in other members of my family at close up in great detail and what it is is it's simply uh, the uh, the breakdown of casuistry and then ordinary people imprisoned in the hallucination of culture language and linear time lock you up and put you away because uh, you're reporting from outside the cultural envelope and carrying information that terrifies, alarms, disturbs, and just you drive other people crazy is what it is. Um, I'm talking now about process schizophrenia, which is the spectacular kind where you bring back information that is absolutely incommiserate with the models of your culture. No, I think it's been said that uh, the world is becoming more schizophrenic well, that's just because they didn't have the word psychedelic. 
a psychedelic experience is essentially a kind of schizophrenia and the people who in the early phase of psychedelic research they wanted to call it a psychotomimetic meaning it mimics psychosis it doesn't mimic psychosis it's a schizomimetic of some sort psychosis is a whole different uh, pathology but uh, schizophrenia is simply a uh, uh, a category for uh, behavior and insight that the rest of society is unable to do anything with, I think. Yeah, no, that doesn't trouble me at all. I like, I like talking about how I'm schizophrenic. Maybe this answers your uh, criticism that I'm linear and running down and old. I can always go nuts. <laughs> You know, if all else fails, you can go bananas, I suppose. <laughs> the schizophrenics return with the great aesthetic visions and the scientific breakthroughs and the poetic understandings. I mean, uh, and it's almost as though they have been aided by the demon artificers. They have taken into their uh, retinue uh, supernatural helpers and a shaman would say of course allies and I'm sure you all know the way in which schizophrenia and shamanism map together I mean our own Julian Silverman is the great pioneer in the one-to-one -one mapping of shamanism and schizophrenia and years ago when I was completely bananas every time they would approach from three sides with nets I had Julian's paper called shamanism and schizophrenia and I could quote it chapter and verse and back them off uh, because uh, what is called the initiatory crisis in shamanism is nothing more than a schizophrenic break with ordinary reality the problem is we freak out completely and rush to drug people and give them a electroshock and tie them down and slap them around well so then the the uh, unfolding of the process is interrupted and it, it's as though you were to you know perform surgery on a fetus or something and then be amazed when it turns out a monstrosity when if you would just have left it alone for crying out loud it was unfolding along its own creodes of morphological development this is why people like R.D. Lang seem to me to be the ones who thought most deeply and correctly about schizophrenia. To become schizophrenic is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. The trick is to make sure that you're nowhere where straight people can get at you. And uh, my schizophrenic episode occurred in the Amazon basin and you know it was five days march to just a mission and I've always felt that evading modern mental health care facilities saved my mind absolutely and in a traditional society it's supported you know if someone shows signs uh, because they're dreamy or they hallucinate or they're epileptic or something like that then this is encouraged and they're put under the care of shamans and drugs are used to initiate the crisis in some cases and and it's a cause for great rejoicing to have these personalities because in the culture because they're the antennas for the culture that are contacting the uh, raw stuff of real being and transducing it down into uh, cultural artifacts and institutions that then are useful. Anything else? Grandfather paradox. Oh yeah, what did you want to say? I don't think, I mean, I, your your idea of the endpoint makes perfect sense to me, and I don't think the grandfather paradox is an objection. It's, it's not really a paradox. No, I don't think it's a yeah, paradox. I mean, you know, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a self-consistent universe. You're, 
you're here, so you didn't kill your... If, if you killed your grandfather, you wouldn't be here to ask the, ask the question. I think so that's the way to handle that. I think when we finally really understand time travel, we may find out that it's common as dirt and has been going on all around us in all kinds of physical the processes. Up stories. I mean, the, the human mind likes to make up stories, so if you came back and killed your grandfather and you're still here, then we'd have to make up a story. Like somebody else got into your grandmother. Like that. So, but since that doesn't isn't how it works. Well, it may be working that way. I mean, I mean people people disappear mysteriously, and, and uh, all sorts of things happen, and we just fit them into a framework that makes sense to us. And when we when we're in a realm of time travel, then maybe we'll have to reinterpret all that weird stuff that occurred in history. That's an excellent point. That. Uh, all kinds of stuff goes on around us that may be, in fact, the collapse of paradoxical situations that we don't understand, like, you know, all these well-documented cases of spontaneous human combustion and stuff like that. I mean, uh, unless you just flat out deny that this goes on, which is a kind of cop-out, I think, because it just means you don't believe... Uh, large bodies of evidence. I mean, not everything weird that's claimed goes on. But on the other hand, I don't think God is a Republican. I think there's plenty of weird shit flying around. And, and as I said, nowhere is it writ that anthropoid apes should understand reality. And every culture that's ever existed has operated under the illusion that it understood 95% of reality and that the other 5% would be delivered in the next 18 months. And from Egypt forward, they've been running around believing they had a perfect grip on things. And yet we look back at every society that preceded us with great smugness at how naive they all were. Well, it never occurs to us then that maybe we're whistling in the dark too that the universe is stranger than you can suppose and that that openness that that perception imparts is a great joy a great blessing because then you can live your life not in service to some fascistic metaphor but in service to the living mystery the fact that you're not going to understand it it is not going to yield to logic or magic or any other technique that's been developed. It's bigger, you know, the novelist John Crowley has this wonderful aphorism, the further in you go, the bigger it gets. And I think this is true of most things. Uh, that's all, folks. <laughs> we got through another one of these. Okay, thank you all for coming. I do not understand why you put up with this. But I appreciate it. I do appreciate it.